Let's pray. Father, that is indeed our prayer today, that you would speak to us, that as we open your word now at this time in our service, that, Lord, that you would incline the ears of our hearts and our minds to hear your truth, and, Father, to be transformed by it. Lord, we ask today that you would move in this place, that you would cause believers to be deeper in their walk with you, to be closer in their walk with you, that you would draw non-believers to yourself, Father, through the work of your Spirit, that God in all things, that much would be made of you today, that you would be central, that the cross of your Son, Jesus Christ, would be our vision, and that God, that we would more fully and humbly submit ourselves to you as your children. God, we pray today, we pray today, that you would move. Lord, we lift up to, to you those who have great need this morning. Father, we recognize that we live in a fallen world and that so long as we dwell in this flesh and in this body that we will remain at odds with this world. That, Father, sin and death seek to, to take us, to overcome us. And, Father, that illness an injury, all of these things that beset us in this world will remain a reality until you return. So it is our cry today in light of this, come Lord Jesus. And yet, Father, we know that you hear the cries of our hearts. So we do lift up to you those who, who Father, are looking at surgery, who are recovering from surgery. We praise you for, Lord, successful treatments we praise you that these procedures often work, and yet, Father, we recognize that with the limitations of man that occasionally they do not. So, Father, while we pray for healing on the one hand, we pray for peace on the other. While we pray for, for your good blessings on the one hand, we recognize that sometimes your good blessings don't always come as we anticipate. So, Father, help us above all else to trust in you. We thank you. Father, for the many good things that you've given us in this life, and we pray for those who suffer and who have need. Bless us now, God, as we look to your word, recognizing that it alone can sustain us and nourish us and fill our hearts with the love and mercy that we find in Christ. And we pray it all in his name. Amen. Well, I want to encourage any of our young people who may be in here, if you wish to head to Children's Church, you can begin to make your way to the rear of the auditorium. The remainder of us will be in <clears throat> the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 12 this morning. You can begin turning there in your Bibles, and we will look to that passage in just a moment. This is an opportunity we have as we step into a new year to really reevaluate and refocus on purpose. What is the purpose of Grace Community Church? And by extent, what is the purpose of the individual Christian? Why are we here this morning worshiping? Why do we live in the communities where we live and do business with and interact with the people that we interact with? Well, <clears throat> God has placed us here with purpose, with reason, and it is my intent today and over the next couple of weeks to visit and reiterate that purpose and that function. The Westminster Catechism, a great Presbyterian document that I think we can all agree with on this point, begins with the statement or the question, what is man's chief end? And the answer to that question is man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Church, that is why we are here for the glory and enjoyment of God. We have been called with a purpose because of the work of Jesus Christ to hold high the name and work of Jesus Christ and to allow that to shine into this world in which we live. Over these next few weeks, we're going to be exploring two of the most important principles in all the New Testament, the great commandment, and the Great Commission. The Great Commandment has two parts, and we will begin today by looking at the first part. 
we will begin by looking at what it means to love God. And so we see that the Bible makes clear the importance of loving God. Can love be something, however, that is demanded? Well, friends, I believe that the Bible says that it is something that can be demanded. In fact, our first note, if you're following along in your outline, the first note you'll see is that God demands adoration. God demands that we love Him. This is a command that He has given to us. And friends, therefore, we have to understand that loving God, and by extension, as we'll see, loving people, is something more than just emotions. Emotions are something that are difficult for us to control, and so it's difficult for us to command them, if you will. But as I hope you see today, love is much more than an emotion. Those of you in here who are married especially those of you in here who have been married for a long period of time, know that if you rely solely or even primarily on your emotions as the guide for how you love or treat your mate, your marriage would not have lasted. Your emotions will lie to you. Your emotions will encourage you to do things that are selfish and often wrong. No, we have to overcome our emotions and we have to love and serve despite the way we might feel. God demands this adoration. John 14, verses, verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is how we demonstrate our love to God. Not simply by saying, yes, God, I love you, but perhaps more importantly, by doing what God has said for us to do in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, which are precious verses concerning the love of God. This is sometimes in, in Hebrew culture, in the, in the Jewish religion, referred to as the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is One, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Notice what's missing here. It doesn't say love the Lord your God with all your feelings because our feelings can be fleeting and they often change from moment to moment. No, our love from God is not something that is fleeting. Our love for God is something that has been secured by the Holy Spirit. If indeed there is one God, as the Shema says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. If there is one God who stands supremely powerful and valuable, this demands a supreme and total loyalty from you and from me to this God. And this begins with the heart, with love. There is no room as Jesus would say in the Sermon on the Mount, for divided affections. No one can serve two masters, right? So love God. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor, your neighbor as yourself. That's where we're headed next week. What does it mean to love your neighbor? So this is the first and the greatest commandment. The second is like it. But this isn't all we're going to be discussing. We're also going to be talking about the Great Commission. So if we love God and we love people, God determines our assignment. If we're truly submitted ourselves to God and He is the chief end of our affections, He is the chief end of what we are seeking to glorify, then he will be the one who determines how we live our lives. And in the Great Commission, he tells us, doesn't he? Jesus tells us, if you love God, if you love your neighbor, then go and make disciples. Friends, this is essentially the whole of the Christian life. Love God, love people, make disciples. David Platt has put it this way. And others have said it in similar fashion, but Platt specifically said, a disciple is someone who has moved from being a recipient of the church's mission to now being responsible for the church's mission. If you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then that means somebody 
somewhere at some time took the church's mission to you. Took the mission of Christ to you. The gospel was shared and you responded to it. And now that you've responded, you can never be the same as you once were. The gospel is an all-encompassing message. It's not simply come to Jesus so that you can escape the flames of hell. It's come to Jesus because he is an all-satisfying Savior. And if he is indeed an all-satisfying Savior, then that will affect everything about you. Do we love Christ with that kind of love? Well, I think often that question can be answered by how we respond to God's commands. If we love him, we will do as he has commanded us. And we see here in the scripture that God is calling us to make disciples. Making disciples is a twofold mission, and we'll deal with this again in a couple of weeks, but just as a, a groundwork before we look to our text this morning. The gospel is twofold. First, it's about initiating the gospel call. The, the, the act of making disciples first begins with calling people to be converted, to be born again, to be saved. That's the first step. The second step, of course, is helping people to internalize gospel concepts. So it's not about just calling them to faith. It's also about helping their faith to become more developed. Developing love and holiness and knowledge and faithfulness and obedience. All of these things are part of discipleship. And my prayer, Christian, for you today is that you're not simply content with being a convert, but that you would be a person who is sold out to being and making disciples. This is our call. This is a costly call. And yet it's a simple call. As Mark Dever has put it, discipleship is simply helping someone to follow Jesus. So, so with that being the case, I, I've kind of boiled our, our series down into a math problem. Okay? And we have some slides that I think will help illustrate that this morning. Okay? First of all, if we begin with the premise, the, the greatest, the chief end of man is to glorify God, and we'll, we'll boil it down using Jesus' words here in Mark 12. If it's loving God, so loving God, the first element of the Great Commission, loving God plus loving people, you put these two pieces of the puzzle together, so love God, love people, when you combine those, what we have is make disciples. Friends, the reality is, is affection drives action. Affection drives action. If we truly love God, and if we truly love people, then it will cause us to go and make disciples. It will cause us to go and share the gospel, and to help people to be rooted up, built up, and to grow in their faith. I love Disney World. My family and I go frequently to Disney World for vacation. It's my happy place. Barbara and I actually went there on our honeymoon. Yes, we were adults when we got married and we went to Disney World. My kids have grown to love it too. And that makes my heart smile. We've gone many times. In fact, I think later this year we're trying to put a trip together and head down there. I know a lot about Disney World. So there are a few things that I subscribe to. I have some podcasts on, on preaching and sermon prep and just some other things that I subscribe to. But I also have a couple of podcasts that I subscribe to that talk about Disney World. Some of you are giggling. You're thinking, this is a grown man up here. But it is a place that I'm passionate about. I love Disney World. I have a lot of memories there. My family growing up went on occasion to Disney World. I, I know a lot of things that have happened and changed about Disney World since it opened in 1971. And 
I just love the place. And it's interesting, and Pastor Douglas recently has, has shared with, uh, with me about how he and a group of friends, and, and uh, they take Emily along as well, I think, they go on vacation regularly. And I said, you need to check out Disney World, man. And so Wally recently mentioned also, he was thinking about taking Carrie to, I hope I'm not spoiling anything here, taking Carrie to Europe at some point this year. I said, no, forget Europe, man, go to Disney World. He said, if you go to Epcot at Disney World, you can hit like three different European countries all in one day. Because I have such passion for Disney World, I want other people to experience it also. Friends, if we are truly passionate about God, then why are our lips often so tight when it comes to introducing people to him? Something's not meeting up. I believe that passion desires company. And if we are passionate about God and his word and his gospel, then we will desire to take as many people along with us on that journey. In the same way that I love Disney World and want to take everybody in the world with me to experience how cool it is, how in the world can we have experienced God who is infinitely greater than any vacation spot, infinitely greater than anywhere we could go or anything we could love, how can we have experienced him and be silent about it? The point is, if we love something, we want those that we love to love it also. Joy desires company. So, if we love God and we love people, those two things together will cause us to want to introduce those people that we love to the God that we love. The great commandment leads us to the great commission. Stand with me this morning as we read from God's word in Mark chapter 12. We'll begin with verse 28 this morning. It says, one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. I'll give you some background on this text in a moment. And seeing that he, Jesus, answered them well, asked, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher, you have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than the whole, than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. Father, this is your word today. I pray, Lord, that we would have minds to perceive the truth of this text and that we would walk away this morning, God, having a deeper love and a deeper passion for you and for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As we step into this text this morning, it's, it's sort of mid-chapter, even mid-conversation. And what we see earlier is a group of religious leaders trying to trip Jesus up. They often did this. They often tried to get Jesus to say things that would get him in trouble. In fact, that's ultimately the reason that Jesus would be crucified, at least in a, in a worldly, from a worldly perspective. Jesus began to say some things that the religious leaders found to be blasphemous, heretical even, claiming equality with God, claiming to be the Son of God. This is what got Jesus killed. So they were always asking him because Jesus was a competitor of theirs. In the, in the market of religious ideas, Jesus was a competitor of the Pharisees and scribes and the law keepers. Why? Because Jesus came to preach a gospel of grace. 
something that they knew very little about. So as they're trying to trip Jesus up, it's interesting, this this particular religious leader, this particular scribe asks Jesus a question, he answers it, and then he agrees with Jesus. Now if you're trying to trip somebody up, agreeing with them is not usually the easiest way to do it. And yet he is agreeing with him, as we see Jesus saying here, because this man is close to the kingdom of God. He's almost there. He's internalized some of these realities. He, he, is, he has received certain truths as real, and yet he has not crossed over yet into new life. Friends, I hope this serves at least initially as a warning text for some of you, because I fear that in the church today, even here at Grace Community Church, there are many people who have internalized certain truths, who believe certain things about God, and yet you do not know him. In the same way that I know a lot about Disney World, I've never met Walt Disney. He died many years before I was born. You can know a lot about the gospel without knowing its author. And so, friend, my appeal to you before we dive into this text today is that you would not only know truth in an intellectual sense, but that you would know truth in knowing Jesus Christ. He desires a personal relationship with us. Let's walk through this text because there's a lot of things it's saying. We're going to focus specifically on the text that Jesus is quoting today from Deuteronomy 6, the Shema. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first of the great commandments. So first, what does Jesus say? How are we supposed to love God? Jesus says, in quoting in step with the Old Testament authors, he says, you're supposed to love the Lord with all your heart. Love the Lord with your heart. Our hearts is the essence of who we are. And friends, sadly, the Bible tells us that the natural man has a heart that is wicked. So this creates a problem. How can we as people who are naturally sinful at heart, how can we love God who hates sin? This creates a problem, doesn't it? Doesn't it? I, I recently wrote, I said, we sin because we love sin. And suppressing that love makes us vile, bitter, legalistic. What we need is not merely a stronger willpower to overcome the desires of our heart, but a new love that altogether reorients the desires of our hearts. The cure in our lives for the sin problem is a greater love. And there is no greater love than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Jesus is love. Friends, he is the affection that you're seeking. If you want to reorient the sinful desires of our hearts, the only one who can do that is Jesus. He's the only one who can fix you. You can't fix you. If you're here today and you think you can fix you, then then do this. Go home today and just stop sinning. Just don't do it anymore. Go fix yourself. Let me know how that works out for you. What we need is a Savior who is able to both change our hearts and forgive our hearts. To both change our lives and forgive our lives. We cannot obey the commands of to, to love God with all our heart unless God reorients our hearts, unless He changes our hearts. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the spring of life. How do we do this? Well, we do this with aid of the Holy Spirit. We cannot do this on our own. This is why we need a Redeemer. This is why Christ has come, because man is not capable of taking care of his own sin problem. God speaks of a new covenant. In the Old Testament, he speaks of a new covenant. When God would place his word in people's hearts, Jeremiah 31 is one of the most beautiful chapters, I believe, in the Old Testament. The prophet Jeremiah says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
Not like the old covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand and bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, <coughs> declares the Lord, I will put my law within them. I will write on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each teach his own neighbor or teach his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. From the least to the greatest, declares the Lord, I will forgive their iniquity, their sin, and I will remember it no more. Hallelujah. Oh, friends, as, as the Jews would have read this in the times of the Old Testament, they would have been longing for this one who would come to establish this new covenant. And here on this side of the cross, we can look back and say, that's Jesus. He is the one who has come and has established it and has taken our sin as far as the east is from the west. If that doesn't cause your heart to love God, nothing will. No, the gospel is what inclines our heart toward God. We cannot love the Lord our God with all our hearts unless we know Jesus Christ. So do you know him today? Do you truly love God today? You cannot love God unless you know Jesus. Second, Jesus here in quoting from the Shema in Deuteronomy 6 says, they'll love the Lord with all your soul, with all your soul. If our hearts are kind of the physical essence of self, then our souls are our spiritual essence. The pairing together of these terms, the heart and the soul, means that God wants us not only to love him with our bodies, but also with our entire being, physical and spiritual, together. But again, we see that when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, it wasn't simply a problem of their heart, it was a problem with their soul. The Bible describes people in their fallen state as being children of the devil. This is a spiritual statement. We cannot love God this way unless we have been reborn. Sure, even carnal man craves the benefits of God. If you were to go on the streets today and begin asking questions of people <clears throat> and were to say, when you die, would you like to go to heaven or to hell? If you can get past those individuals who deny that either of those realities exist, most people, in fact, I can't think of anybody that would answer that question that would say, oh, I'd rather go to hell. Sure, I'll take hell. No, people, even carnal people, lost people, desire the benefits of God. What separates the believer from the lost person is that our greatest desire is not simply in God's benefits. Our greatest love is in God himself. We don't simply want God's gifts. We don't simply treasure the gifts he gives. We treasure the gift giver. And God has promised to us a redemption that is both spiritual and physical, that is both heart and soul. Even a lost person could, could echo the sentiments of, of, say, Psalm 84, where it says, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul sings and faints for the courts of God. This part of this psalm is singing about the grandeur and greatness of heaven. But as you go a little deeper into the psalm, only a redeemed person could say, my heart and my flesh sing for the glory of the living God. Many people might say, yes, I want heaven. But only the redeemed heart can say, I want God. I've said it in here before, and I'll say it again. I would rather be in hell with Christ than in heaven without him. Let that sink in for a moment. What are you really after? When you came to Christ, did you primarily come to Christ to escape hell? Or did you come to Christ because you knew that by looking upon his face, that you could even walk through hell without being phased. Friends, Jesus, Jesus is the chief end of our affections. 
not heaven, not golden streets or pearly gates. Those things are simply a benefit of loving Christ. You see, there are many people, many people who like the idea of heaven, but far fewer that actually enjoy the idea of loving God on this side of it. My prayer today is that you're loving God with all your heart and with all your soul. Third, third, the Shema in Deuteronomy 6 commands us to love the Lord our God with all of our mind. With all of our mind. One, one recent cultural observer wrote this, evangelicalism has been experiencing a great revival in recent decades. But it's not a revival of the traditional kind, he says. Rather, it's a revival of emotion, not of the knowledge of God. The question of faith, questions of faith have been answered in terms of feeling rather than in terms of truth. The church today is more guided by experience than by biblical convictions. We value enthusiasm more than informed commitment. And I think he's absolutely right. Most conversations that people have as they walk out of worship surround much more the way that a message made them feel than it did the way that a message caused them to live. Oh, I really didn't like the way that, that Pastor Travis said this or said that. He didn't make me feel good today. Now, the problem that we have is that we often disengage our minds from our love of God. We prop up emotion and feeling as the determiner. And I think that this is a symptom of love in the broader context. When we talk about love, being in love with somebody, how do we describe it? We describe it in a way, in terms of the way that a person makes us feel. Oh, I couldn't imagine living my life without her. We think of rainbows and butterflies. It's all good. Everything's great. And the problem is, is that love is work. Love can be hard. Love can be trying. And again, those of you who have been married for a long time know this to be the case. For those of you in here who are newlyweds or are thinking about marriage, I hope and pray that you connect with someone who has been in marriage for a long period of time to help you understand that there will be a time where the feelings subside a bit. And you have to love by gritting your teeth. This is just reality. That doesn't make it any less loving. It simply is an acknowledgement that we as a people, well, we have a part of us that is yet to be redeemed. That our hearts are still inclined towards selfishness. And that that shines through very brightly in our relationships even on this earth so we are called to love the lord our god with all our mind now i want to be clear emotion in and of itself is not a bad thing emotion can actually be a good thing however emotion should follow convictions and not the other way around your convictions ought to be concerning god and concerning god's love ought to be derived from the scripture and that truth ought to serve as a foundation for your emotions, not the other way around. I, I can't tell you the number of conversations that I've had throughout my years of pastoring where a person will come to me and will say, Pastor, this is, this is a, a problem. You said this in a sermon, and, and I really disagree with that. It, it doesn't make me feel good, or I don't like the, the way that you put it. And in many occasions, the thing that they have a problem with was a quotation of Scripture. Friends, my hope is, is that we would cause our emotions to be subservient to truth. May truth undergird our feelings. And where our feelings don't align with truth, may we seek not to realign truth to our feelings, but to realign our feelings to what God's Word has to say. We should love the Lord our God with all our mind. Colossians 3, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. 
And then it goes down a little bit further. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in what? In knowledge. We need a renewed mind in order to love God the way we are called to. Heart, soul, mind, and forth strength. Love the Lord your God with all your strength. That is your will, your endurance, your desires. Believers ought to have a desire to love God. It's not a burdensome task, although it's not always easy. We do occasionally have to work at loving God. And oftentimes we have to work, we have to overcome our emotions or overcome our circumstances to love God because we don't always understand our emotions and our circumstances. The reality is is that if we could choose all of the events and all the circumstances of our lives, we would do it much differently than God has done it. And yet God's plan for us is perfect. So we must acknowledge that there are things that we would do that would be different than God's and where we would do something different than God. The problem is not with God, it's with us. No, we should love the Lord our God with all our strength, our will, our endurance. Now, I want to be careful. It can be burdensome and difficult to love certain people. Just ask my wife. It can be a struggle to love me. I know some of you better than I know others. It can be a struggle to love some of you also. But God, God has commanded that we love him. Why? Because in loving him, there is no greater joy. You see, in Matthew 24, Jesus speaks of a coming tribulation. He says, they'll deliver you up to tribulation and even put you to death, Jesus says. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will rise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. To love God with all of our strength is an act of endurance. You have to wake up daily take up your cross each morning and follow him that is loving god with all your strength and friends i want to be crystal clear not only with this point but with each point we've covered all of these things the strength that you need to love god you don't get that from within yourself that is a gift from the holy spirit The heart that you need, the soul that you need, the mind that you need to love God, that's not something that you simply conjure up. These are gifts that God gives you at salvation. Are you becoming a disciple of Christ, deepening in your walk with Him? This this is how we know that we love God. With all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and with all our strength. And all of these things are gifts that God gives us. Friend, today, maybe you're struggling to love God. Maybe you're not among the believers who were able to raise their hands earlier when Stan asked the question of who's been saved. Maybe that's not you today. Maybe you don't love God in the ways that have been described. You don't love God in those ways because apart from the Holy Spirit, you can't love God in these ways. And I believe wholeheartedly, I believe wholeheartedly that if you're here today And that if you desire to love God, that he is calling you to himself to be saved. The Bible tells us that we have sinned. Our hearts are wicked. Our souls are fallen. Our minds are depraved. Our strength is founded upon wrong foundations. The Bible makes it clear that we are not able to please God apart from Christ. And so if you're here and you have this desire to love God, then I would encourage you to look to Christ. As he hung upon that tree, he hung there for your sin and for mine. He died a death that we deserve to accomplish a salvation that we could never earn. 
And if you will but look to him and believe, the Bible says that you will be saved. And upon being saved, you will receive the Holy Spirit. And upon receiving the Holy Spirit, you will, for the first time, love God. Stand with me this morning. We're going to sing one final song.